Well, welcome to another edition of uh, My Life in Football. And as you can see, Steve, unfortunately, is unavailable today, but uh, his loss is my game because uh, I'm joined today by the, one of the most living legends of uh, refereeing in this country. And of course, it's Mr. Keith Hackett. And uh, welcome, Keith. It's a pleasure to have you on, sir. Delighted to be on. Talking football is uh, a passion. So hopefully we'll cover a few subjects. And uh, <laughs> there's no uh, bars... Uh, in terms of what you can discuss and what we go through, it, you know, I always take the view, let's be honest and let's say as it, as it is. Don't worry, Tony Gale's not going to pop up at any time during this interview, so you're all right. But in all, in all fairness, I mean, the first question I always ask people is, you know, in these sort of, in this show is, is how did, how did sort of young Keith sort of first get involved in, in, in football? I mean, when did it all start for you? Was it, was it playing wise or was it, did you sort of, was you helping out in different clubs and so forth and then into refereeing from there? I mean, where, where did it all no, start? No, I, I, it's a good question. I, I played for a local team. Uh, I'd obviously played for my school team, but I'd, I'd played for a local team at grassroots level. Um, and, um, uh, all of a sudden, the, the county FA decided that uh, football teams, where, where possible, would send at least one player to a meeting to discuss uh, the laws of the game. And, uh, and then that might expand into taking the referee's course and the laws of the game, which I did. And I was quite happy playing. I wasn't a great player by any chance. I just was team captain and was the guy that was pushed to go to the meeting. Um, it, it was interesting. I mean, you know, as a player, I thought I knew the laws of the game, but I clearly did not. And um, so I had no intention. I came away. To, I'd enjoyed it. It, it was uh, six evenings over, over a six-week period. I took this exam and passed it. That was going to be the end of it. And then uh, one particular Saturday, a few weeks later, our team wasn't playing. And uh, I got a call from the county FA secretary then, and it was uh, Mr. Hackett, uh, Hillsborough Boys Club versus Sheffield United Juniors, intake school, Saturday, kick off 3, 3 p.m. and put the phone down. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't even have the chance of saying no. I thought to myself, I wonder how he knows I haven't got a game. Somebody had obviously let on. Um, and I went to intake school, refereed a football match. Um, probably didn't know what I was doing. And some would say that that was always the case, but um, enjoyed it. I came off and this guy came up to me. He, he was connected with Sheffield United juniors and said, look, uh, I think you've refereed really well. How long have you been refereeing? And I think when I told him he, this was my first game, he, he was gobsmacked. Um, and then I got encouragement from him to, to really get involved in refereeing. And, and it all sort of went from there. But, you know, uh, I think what lots of people are not aware of is that it, it's not an easy ride to the top. I mean, I spent 12 years of refereeing at grassroots level. Uh, almost every field in Sheffield I've refereed on. Um, and I can tell you that there's very little football fields in Sheffield that are flat. <laughs> even, even, dare I say, the oldest football ground in the world, which is here in Sheffield, Hallam FC still play on it. Um, it's at Sandygate uh, Lane, and even that's got a hill. So, you know, when, when, when you're refereed on that, you had to be reasonably fit. Mm. And your exposure was the fact that the clubhouse was at the top end of the pitch. And if you were caught at the bottom and somebody belted the ball upfield and there was screams of offside and, and you were nowhere near it, those spectators made you fully aware <laughs> that one, you weren't up with play and two, you, you dropped a clangor. <laughs> uh, so it was a, a good introduction. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, information I've got here says, it says, literally says on here, it says, reach uh, the, yourself, you reach sort of like the Northern Premier League level uh, in uh, becoming, uh, so, and also becoming a football league um, linesman in 1972. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, how, what, what, did, what was that like? Was it sort of all of a sudden, all of a sudden being there and, and reffing in the Northern Premier League? Oh, it, it, you know, I was there. It, it was a newly formed league. Um, it, it was incredible because, 
I'd been brought up in Sheffield. We, we didn't have semi-professional football. Um, I'd refereed in the Yorkshire League, which was, you know, a gentle pace and, yeah, okay, good football, but, but well-disciplined, well-behaved. All of a sudden, I found myself going to Northwich Victoria, Altrincham, and various clubs um, around the Northwest. And the all atmosphere changed because these guys were paying, playing for money. Uh, and of course, you know, I, even going to Boston United where Jim Smith was the manager, uh, who, who later became fairly famous for his exploits with Derby and other clubs. Um, and so it was a, a, it was a great learning curve. And, and you know, uh, I always remember uh, doing a, a, a cup game, believe it or not, at Northwich Victoria versus Wigan Athletic. And um, on my way over driving to Northwich, uh, I had a car smash. Uh, policeman had signaled me to come through a red light uh, because the lights weren't working. And that seemed OK until someone decided he was on a green and he, he crashed into the side of me, spun a brand new car around. It was a company car. I always remember it. Uh, and uh, even the copper helped me to get the, the sort of panel away from the door so that I could get to the football match. Got to the football match. My mate was with me, refereed it. The guy came in after the match to pay me my fee. And he went, I can't believe it. And I go, what do you mean? I can't believe the performance I've just witnessed. Are you going to take this match fee? And I go, well, that's part and parcel of me doing the job. And uh, as I got in my car, my mate said to me, I don't, I know you had the car smash. You shouldn't have refereed. You clearly weren't at the races. And I thought that was great until the following week. I hadn't got a game. And uh, I got a call from the FA saying, uh, we're going to appoint you to a game. And I looked, great. FA Cup, fantastic. Early round. Um, Northwich Victoria versus Wigan Athletic. I couldn't believe it, the same two teams. And I've got to tell you, before I found out an excuse, uh, you know, I hadn't had a heart attack. I wasn't dying, but I, I knew then I'd got to go and do this game. And uh, I sneaked into the ground and I thought, I'll just, I'll just be quiet. And the guy who paid me came in to offer me a cup of tea. And he was shocked. He wasn't surprised. He was shocked. Um, and he goes, you haven't got a twin brother, have you? And I've gone, no. And he went, oh, I wish you had. And I go, why? He said, oh. he said, I've got to tell you, you're the worst referee that's ever been at this ground. And I've gone like, oh. And the, the two linesmen that were with me looked at me gone out because I, gained a, I was gaining a reputation. A good one. And so I explained to them what had gone on. And I thought, well, okay, fresh number of spectators. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get away with this. And as I'm walking out to the middle, the guy on the mic shouts, uh, you might recognise the referee today. You're right. You're absolutely right. It's Keith Ackett from Sheffield. Remember him. Did he go home from last week's match? <laughs> was he allowed into his house? <laughs> and that was the start of the game. Uh, fortunately, it went well. Uh, players of both teams uh, shook my hand. And, I mean, one of them came up to the captain of the home team and said, Keith, uh, I have to tell you, I don't know how you can referee this like this this week and like you refereed last week. And, uh, of course, eventually they got to know uh, that I'd had a car crash on the way and shouldn't have done it. But hey, these are, these are, they, this was the introduction to the Northern Premier League. And Wigan, of course, then went on to become a Premier League team eventually. But it was a great ground. Well, what was it like, though, also being able to sort of, you know, run the line in, you know, in, in the Football League as well? Because that oh. must have been a bit of a, a, a real a sort of nervous thing as well. Uh, I mean, those first games, you help through. In fairness, what what I recognised was that it was pretty evident that I was with an experienced linesman on the other touchline and the referee was an experienced referee and uh, it was amazing how often and how much the referee covered my half of the game 
and not the other, and how much involvement the other linesman had, signalling free kicks, offsides, throw-ins, everything that was going. And afterwards, the referee said, well, I, I enjoyed what you were doing. And I went, amazing how you cover the game from my off. And he said, well, just keeping an eye on you, making certain. So he obviously hadn't got the confidence. He recognised it was my first game. It, it was always, uh, for me, a very difficult job. Uh, you had to hold concentration. Um, you know, I, I, I then went on to referee, uh, run the line, believe it or not, in the European Cup semi-final, uh, Spain versus Denmark in 84. Some years later, I was then a, a referee. But I touch on a story of uh, one of my early, early games was at Nottingham Forest, because you didn't have this. You know, you were a match official on the Football League. You were Division 1, 2, 3 and 4. And the appointments came in that, in that way. Immediately after Christmas the, of your first season, you started getting trips to Old Trafford and Main Road and, like, you're going, wow, this is fantastic. And I, I remember this game at Forest. They were playing West Brom. And it was very shortly after they'd signed a million-pound player, Trevor Francis. It was, it was incredible. And I saw him in the tunnel. But as I walked across the car park, I see the grey and green vans of much of the day. And I've gone, television, I'm on. I'm not going out with my mates tonight for a pint. I'm going to actually watch myself. Ego at its highest level. I want to watch myself on television. <laughs> and uh, I get into the dressing room, having walked across a, a fairly big car park at Forest. And Roy Cape was the referee. A really nice guy and I said to Roy match of the day is here and he goes yeah he goes it's no different son you have to referee the game run the line the same way you don't have to worry about the cameras and as I walked out on the field I've decided there's a camera in the main stand there's one very reasonably close to cloth and there's one on the right hand goal but not one so there were three cameras and I've gone right I, I want to be opposite the field facing them so I've made a I've made a dash for the for the touchline facing the main stand, and we're we're you know I've got I've got like the Nottingham Forest attack, and they've got some players in there, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm definitely going to be on TV. But about twenty minutes into this game, I'd not even raised the flag for the ball in and out of play I, because the play was all in the Forest defending area, and Ali Brown of West Brom had actually scored a hat trick and the crowd are unhappy. Um, and I'm, I'm getting a bit like disappointed that I've not made a decision. So I'm thinking maybe I'll not be on match of the day. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'll go out with my mates for a pint. And then all of a sudden the ball comes to John Robertson, who's on the left wing and he's a yard offside. The flag goes up. I'm, I'm waving it like hell. And Robertson's got possession. I look towards the referee, who's completely not seen the flag. He's on his way. We ain't got buzzers. We ain't got communication kit. He's on his way, Robertson. And he's a Scottish international, and he could play a bit. And I'm thinking, the longer it went on, it was like a nightmare. And I begin to drop the flag. I'm, I'm like, do I, do I drop <laughs> And I've half, I've, half, I've half dropped it. And I look across and he scores. And Cape is given the goal. The, the referees signal the goal. The crowd behind me are ecstatic. It's 3-1. But my flag's halfway down. And I'm thinking, hope he doesn't see it. And of course he does. Gives the offside. And within seconds, I've got five or six quid in loose change. I can see openly on the field. Some have just caught me. And then a beer can whizzes past. And I've gone, that's a bit dangerous. So I inch down the line towards a copper sat on a canvas seat. And I've, I've liked trying to attract his attention, but there's a big noise and the crowd are booing me and everything's going off. And I've inched down, looked towards him. Eventually I got his attention. I must have been about three yards away from him. And he goes, yeah, what do you want? And I've gone, I need protection, mate. He's throwing things at me. And he went, 
off. That's never offside in a million years, you pillock. And that was that was my introduction to running the line. So forgive me for telling that story. It's the memory buttons. I didn't enjoy running the line. So when I was announced that I was going to be on the supplementary list, that's the season they give you up to 10 games and they get you get a feel for it, which I think, thought was a good system. Yeah. Um, and introduced me to the bigger games. And and that was the kickstart. So my first game was at uh, Stockport County versus Northampton. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I can remember in that game, the captain saying to me, Keith, you've got to concentrate on the game and not look at the aeroplanes going over because Stockport County's ground is on the direct flight path to Manchester Airport. It's on the outskirts of Manchester. And believe me, the planes are a bit low. <laughs> and so... So you're beating the noise of the plane sometimes when you're blowing the whistle, but yeah, it, it was uh, enjoyable. <laughs> I mean, it says, it says three years later, he advanced to the supplementary, as you just said, a rough phrase, one year later in 1970, he made it to the full uh, list at the age of only 32. He made a progress in 1979 with senior linesman. And this is one of the games for me that sticks in my mind. I mean, I'm 52. And it's yeah. still for me the great one. There was this now the second greatest game of football I've ever seen. Um, and it's uh, it says in the FA Cup final in the next season, he took charge uh, of an FA Cup semi final. So, so let's, let's go back. So, he made progress in 97 with a senior linesman to Ron Chalice in the FA Cup final, which of course was Manchester United against Arsenal. Yes, it uh, regarded as the five minute cup final, and it was for me. Uh, the, the, the greatest memory of that was I was actually sitting around my aunt's house and, you know, and I think Arsenal were two nil up at the time, weren't they? I think at yeah. the time. And, and I remember um, my aunt turning around to me, we were, as you just said, we were about 10 minutes to go saying to me, Oh, we won the cup, baby, we won the cup. And I said, yeah. I hadn't got the clue what I was saying, but I just turned around to went, now nah, Manchester United are a team that are renowned for coming back. And then of yes. course, I mean, they did. They came back and, 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 and it's history, but what was that like, though, to be involved in an FA Cup final in the first place? And what was the game like for you? Oh, it's, you know, when you, when you take up refereeing, I think most people have ambition. They need to have ambition. And uh, the greatest games that we can have are either at the ground of, where, I think, where, the, where you supported the team as a kid. So mine was Hillsborough and, and Sheffield Wednesday. And, uh, and that year, I'd, I'd had the semi-final, uh, Arsenal-Liverpool. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting the, the final. I've got to be honest, I'm a young kid uh, at that time uh, in refereeing terms. So, you know, I got that appointment for Hillsborough in the semi-final. Um, I used to go there as a kid. I walked the three miles from where I live, stop at the pub on the way with my dad. My dad would have a two or three pints, I'd have the orange juice, and away we'd go. And so when I had the semi-final, that semi-final that year, uh, I, I stayed, uh, I drove my car to where I used to live. It, it, it had been raised to the ground. It was just waistline. Parked the car up, got my bag out of the car, walked to the ground, three miles. Um, and then, of course, walked on to Hillsborough. And, you know, as kids, we all dream, don't we? we? We dream of being either the greatest player or playing on the same pitch as our heroes. And this, for me, was that, that opportunity. So I got that. And I was really honoured to have had that game. And for me, that was almost the close off the season. And you can imagine the euphoria of, of getting a call from the FA saying, you, you know, you, you're going to an FA Cup final. Um, and I'll, I'll dwell the two together because obviously in 81, I had the final, the 100th. Um, you go down um, on the, the Friday morning. Uh, you're staying in a nice hotel. The London Society, Lonsar, bring the referees from around the country and some from the world to a, an eve of final rally. So I attended that. Uh, you meet a lot of the... Referees who are still, if you like, the Jack Taylors, the Pat Partridges, the Clive Thomas, and all those sort of uh, top class referees that you've seen on TV. And then you eventually, you walk out onto the pitch at Wembley. The noise is huge. The occasion, as I was walking out, I was thinking, you know, 
I'd watched the, the 1966 Cup final. Um, I was on holiday in Torquay. And I watched it, I think, through the window of a Ready Fusion shop. No sound, just watching the game and watching, you know. So I, 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 I'd watched a, a Cup final, and, and I'm walking through... And just thinking about the World Cup final and on the same pitch and all, you know, all that history. Uh, Ron Chalice was a brilliant person. Not just a brilliant referee, but a brilliant person. And he made you feel like a hundred foot tall. He, he, you were part of his team. You were given levels of authority that probably exceeded what other, some other referees would do. Some referees would come in the dressing room and say, all I want you to do is run give me ball in and out of play, I'll take everything else. And of course, then when you get that critical offside decision and they're looking for the flag and you've kept it down, they're going, what? <laughs> and then you remind them what they've actually said. Mm. Um, so in that sense, uh, I, I mean, I remember the thing because I got chastised by my own county FA secretary. He rang me up after the final and said, well, I'm sure you enjoyed it and it'll not be your first visit to Wembley. But let me tell you, when you run the line and you hold a flag, you're supposed to hold it because what had happened is I was sweating quite a lot. Uh, through, I think, my own pressure that I put on myself. And as I flagged to indicate uh, a throwing, the flag slipped straight out of my hand and finished up about a yard, two yards down, down the field. And you're going, oops, that's not a good see on TV. But, yeah. Great, great, great game. Um, you know, it, what, it, what it taught me was that you think that a game is going to the conclusion as a, almost, you know, an end. And like you probably, oh, this game's over. Um, and it wasn't. And what I learned from that was that the game's not over until I blind that, blow that final whistle. And then you learn afterwards that when you blow that final, obviously it's still not over because you might have a few jollies where players are not happy with each other and the manager's not happy with you as you go down the tunnel. So, hey, uh, great experience, Wembley. Mm. I mean, what, what end was you at then? Was you at the, the, the Man United 2 goal end or was you at the Alan Sunderland, Alan Sunderland end? Well, it switched. And I, th I think, I, I can't remember. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you what, I was the stand side uh, and I stayed the stand side, outside rights, both halves. So I, I ran the same line. So I, I had both both teams, but it, it was uh, yeah, it was a great occasion. I think there were a lot of people in the, in the crowd shocked by the result eventually. <laughs> it, was, it was, as I said to you, you put in a before, Probably one of the one of the, one of the biggest games that ever sort of sticks in my memory because it was just just one of those games that was just a phenomenal finish and we'll go on to you know another couple as well because it was another Arsenal game of course that you were involved yeah. in as well, which sticks in everybody's memory as well but I mean from from there I mean you come to the end of that season and I mean you must really have thought to yourself well I've done a semi final I've done the final you know I've done the final in two different aspects of of refereeing and, and running the line. You must have been sort of on a sort of real sort of high going into the following season. Yeah, I, I never. What I tried to do was, uh, and I always say to referees, "What has gone is gone." Um, you know, I, it's it's right that referees need to have confidence, confidence in their own, own ability without being arrogant. Um, but you've also got to recognise that. Um, Throughout my career, you know, I might I might be refereeing at Old Trafford and, and Anfield and Highbury and all all the, the famous grounds of, in England. Uh, but then the following morning, on a Sunday morning, I'm refereeing two pub teams mm. because I always refereed at grassroots level. You know, there was a period in my life when uh, I was sales and marketing director for a uh, garage door company. It was based in Arrol Dill uh, near Romford. And so I spent a lot of time in that area. I became a member of the Romford RA. I didn't live there, by the way. I always lived in, in the north. But I used to travel down, stay over a couple of nights. Um, and, uh, you know, I refereed uh, Ford's interdepartmental 
games and they were they were sometimes shocked that maybe I'd been at Leighton Orient or or down at South End and and they'd go, What are you doing here? And but that's the nature of what I consider to be important. The next game is always the important one. Um the game owes you nothing in that sense. And therefore uh I, I always said that you have to go into a game with a with a, a clean white canvas and then what comes in front of you, you deal with as as it goes along. Mm. But the experience is uh, great. I think there's lots of referees. You know, the history of the FA Cup was that it used to be uh, almost the last game for that referee. You know, they used to retire after the FA Cup. Uh, George McCabe, Sheffield referee, did that. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm really at the start of my career. So what I did... After the uh, 81 Cup final, Spurs Man City, um, I was appointed to FIFA, but I was also invited to referee for eight weeks in the North America Soccer League. So I was out almost sampling what a professional referee was like, um, you know, based in New York, but, but flying around to the West Coast, East Coast, South, Tampa, and all, all that goes with it. And I think that was it. That, those eight weeks were a great learning curve because you suddenly had a game that was different. Uh, it was uh, sold in a different way. And of course, you were refereeing players that were world class, but many of them coming to the end of the career. Some were still there. I mean, you know, Gordon Hill and uh, Fairclough for Liverpool um, were playing and, and many other English players. A lot of Leeds United players played for Vancouver Whitecaps. So it was it was a really great experience that not only were you refereeing a football match, you were actually managing an event. There was this, you know, opening game scenario where players were introduced, you were introduced as the guest referee. Um, you know, you had a you had a basis of a different offside scenario because the penalty area line was extended to each touch line and it could only be an offside in that area. You had a penalty shootout was different. No game was a draw. And so you would have a penalty shootout, which was, again was different. I think a 35 yard line, the ball was placed on a 35 yard line. There was a big clock. <coughs> the goalkeeper, when I blew the whistle, off went the forward with the ball on a run and the goalkeeper could come out. Uh, and it seemed uh, more appropriate to football than the current penalty shootout. A bit like the ice hockey, the way they, they take yes. it. Yes. Ice hockey. Yeah, and, and I think, I think uh, you know, those were some of the snippets. I mean, you also had uh, to remember that when a player went down injured, you, you know, there were on occasions when you're saying to the player, stay down, because you'd cross your arms to indicate that's the clock being stopped. Mm. And they would then play an ad mm. uh, on TV. The other thing was an independent timekeeper, and you know, I, and you know, I'm, I'm, I've always since those days been keen that, that the football at the top level should have, like boxing, like hockey, and other, should have an independent timekeeper. Because mm -hmm. at the moment, you know, if you're a fan in football, you're being robbed. You're paying to watch ninety minutes, and you're actually getting between fifty-two and fifty-six minutes of actual playing time. And, and so, therefore, I think the game, um, if we get into the philosophy of things, I think the game has got to look at saying, look, how can we improve value for money? And I think an independent timekeeper would help um, because I, I see games and I, I, I generally think referees are guessing here how much added time. And it's, it's always amazing how there's more added time in the second half than there is in the first. Mm. And, and uh, yeah, I know that there's subs and all that goes with it. But see, we're, we're going into a new season where the law has changed and now the Premier League and the Football League will have five subs and they can use five. You know, I'm, I'm president of the, the Northern Counties East League. I'm also president of Penniston Church. We play in the same league. And we've, we've got to now uh, find space for five, five subs. You know, we've got a mini, we've got a mini bus, yeah. 
Uh, and, and, and these decisions sometimes, I think, are made for the right reasons, but, but don't, they don't see the impact that sometimes this has on, on grassroots football. Mm, no, absolutely. I mean, I mean, go back to 1981. Was you, was you, was you one of the favourites to take that cup final? Absolutely not. Yeah. Definitely not. Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, it was the 100 FA Cup final. Uh, there was a referee who I, uh, who I admired, a, a guy called Clive White, a London referee, and I thought he was a terrific referee. Uh, there was George Courtney. Uh, who was also a top-class referee. So I think there were many referees that I considered were ahead of me. Uh, and so when I received that phone call six weeks before the cup final, it was, uh, it was a complete surprise and a shock. You almost then said, why? Why me? Um, but, you know, the, 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 the occasion was tremendous. It, it, you know, the build-up is... It could be exhausting, it could be tiring, because you're getting all sorts of media asking, uh, will you do interviews, will, will you have photographs and all that goes with it. Um, and of course, television coverage of the FA Cup was more dynamic then than it is now. Not, not in terms of quality of camera work, it was just the whole day. It was amazing. Cup it was just day. the whole day. Yeah, I mean, you didn't go out. Better, the, the best day of the year. It was yeah, and, and so, you know, we got, we got the pies in and the, you know, the chocolate and everything else, the drinks and, and everything. We sat there all day just chatting about football. Um, so, you know, I arrived uh, at the ground. We'd, we'd had the EVA final rally and uh, I arrived at the ground. I, I walked on the pitch trying to just relax. Uh, the Prime Minister was there and uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher and I was introduced to her. And we got into a fairly lengthy conversation because I didn't realise her husband, uh, Dennis, was, was actually at that time a, a rugby union referee, not at a high level. Mm. So there, there was, a, if you like, a connection of wanting to mm. chat. She was obviously killing time. Uh, but, you know, we prepared for the game. The thing that I remember about that was that, I mean, the guy comes in prior to the kickoff and he says to you, and this is... You know, you have to smile when you think back. It's right, Mr. Ackett. You're the final referee. Yes. I'm thinking, why am I here then? Uh, well, you have a choice to make now. This is your biggest decision. I'm going, yeah. The match fee of £35 or the medal, you don't get both. <laughs> and so, yeah. so I refereed the game. Uh, the, the thing that I remember about that game, not Tommy Hutchinson scoring in both ends, but... Um, Ricky Veer being substituted. And he walked around the perimeter of the pitch, head bowed, uh, disappointed, dejected. And I'm thinking, this is football. You know, this is, this is what football does to individuals. It's not always a high. Mm. And uh, so I blew the final whistle. Um, and the first thing was, we didn't have extra time. It was we we were already informed, but they hadn't they hadn't had a replay, they hadn't had a drawn game at Wembley, so there was a bit of rushing around. So uh, what, happened, what happened there though? Just because is is it still the norm that well, it doesn't happen now? But I mean, no, it, it went for it went for a period of time where it did, you know. Yes. But I mean, was it the was it the norm between that period of time that the the, the cup final referee from the Saturday you still refereed the cup final replay? Well, or was it? It had it, it yeah. never happened. Yeah, it had not happened. So as a consequence, one of the things as I walk up the steps, I'm thinking, I'm going to meet the Queen Mother. If she gives me the medal, I'm not going to get the replay. Of course, a bow. Uh, there's no medal. And I walk past with a smile, thinking I've got the replay, but I didn't know that until I got to the bottom of the steps when Reg Payne at the FA said, Keith, you might be interested to know you get, you've got the you got the replay. Uh, but did, the you get replay. Your, did you get your 35 pound? No, <laughs> not nothing. Not uh, uh, for, for that for that first game. Uh, and of course, then uh, you, you, you know, the, you're down the following, you, you're down on the match. You're down, not the day before the game. You you have traveled down that, that particular, the day of the match. Um, and, you know, 
before the game, the, the guy came from the FA came in and said, you'd be pleased to know, Mr Hackett, that you're going to get your £35 match fee and, and the mill. Um, <laughs> and I thought, well, that's great, seeing that you've taken a record attendance figure uh, in terms of money. Uh, but, I, I mean, in the, in the first game, there was about 100,000 spectators. I think that was Wembley capacity. In the second game at night, they reduced it. By ten percent, so 90, ninety-one thousand, um, and it was a, for me. It was a much better game. It was played on the lights. I, I was, you know, I was prepared, and I'd watched uh, the replay. Uh, I'd watched uh, Jerry Gal putting it about a bit, and I'm and I'm thinking, yeah, he's, he'd uh, he'd titled Ollie, Ollie, Ozzy Ardealers a couple of times in the first game, and I'm thinking I've got to keep an eye on him, and so. Very early on in that game, uh, uh, Gal got a yellow card just to calm things down because he he, he got the enthusiasm uh, to to want to lay down uh, Ozzy Ardealis pretty quickly in that game. And, and that was probably, and, and, and again, you know, you, you had that sort of what I would class, and I'd say quite a lot of other people would class, you know, uh, you know, running the line in a very famous cup final because of what happened at the end. And then you get to be a referee, we probably and it's hard for me to say this, being an Arsenal fan, but probably one of the best goals ever scored in a cup final. You get to be privileged to actually see that live yourself from the pitch. I mean, yeah, that was some yeah. goal. Well, I mean, uh, you know, I talked about, didn't I, just a, a few minutes ago, how there's uh, Ricky Villa walking off the pitch, dejected, substituted. And here he was in possession of the ball and I'm following him. Um, and uh, I think he got, again, might have just got a little bit of a nudge. And, I, I you know, the, the whistle's gone towards the, the mouth. Um, and then he dribbles around the players and scores like the winning goal. It was just like, it was almost like a fairy tale mm. for the Spurs fans. Obviously, dejection. But, you know, one of the things that, again, this sums up football for me, you know, we all shout at the referee and, and we all have our own opinions. And I certainly have in recent years with the standard of officiating that I'm witnessing and, and how they're being managed. Um, and I've been very sort of vociferous about that and the way VAR is operated. Um, at the end of the game, I can remember John Bond, the manager of Manchester City, getting up off his seat, uh, walking towards me and thanking me for the two games and said, you can be very pleased with your performances, Mr. Hackett. You didn't let us down. Uh, we, we lost the game, uh, not down to a referee decision. So I, I thought that was, for me, that was a better comment from him than the actual medal. Mm. Because, it, it, you know, it was from a professional manager, uh, someone that was, like most at that time, uh, always easy to... Uh, to give their views. Mm. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, with, with the 81, you know, sort of cut fire, with, with, do, you have, do you often get managers come up to you and say to you, you know, look, well done, or, or is it a case of you get managers sort of just don't bother to say anything to you at all, you just get the abuse? No, I think there are managers who give you a great deal of uh, encouragement. Um, you know, you, you recognise that when you're on the green bit, there's passion. There's passion, you know, there's passion of the players. Uh, there's, 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 you know, equally I'm passionate. Mm. Uh, but the one thing that I think referees have to recognise is that uh, they will make mistakes. But what referees have got to do is park them very quickly and not let them influence the game. So for me, I always had the view that if a manager was unhappy with a performance, I, I used to say, come and join me in the dressing room mm. and let, let's talk it through. And uh, I think, you know, when I went on to become the boss of the PGMOL, it was one of the things that I thought was really important. And that was when a manager was unhappy with uh, a decision. Mm. Um, and I felt that the referee had got it wrong as well. And he was at my employee that one, that those match officials were accountable, and two, I would go and explain um, what the scenario was. Mm. And sometimes that, that would benefit. It wasn't table bashing, 
You know, I, I can remember uh, going to see Sam Allardyce, who was very unhappy with an offside decision. I'd looked at it on TV, on my videos, and I thought the, the assistant referee had got it right until Sam, and uh, at, on, on this particular day that I was at uh, their training ground uh, at Bolton Wanderers, and he, he said to me, Keith, look, I'm going to show you something called Prozone. And I think you'll be a bit shocked because this will clip it and show you the line across the pitch, which it did, almost like what we see now. And, of course, at that time, I put my hand up and said, yeah, you know, you've got better technology than the human eye. And therefore, uh, I don't disagree. But what I did do from that meeting was drive. I asked where, where this system was, because Arsenal were using it, Wenger, Man United were using it, Everton were using it, and Bolton were using it, and, and it was a company in Leeds. And I, I drove straight from Chorley, their training ground, to Leeds, knocked on the door at these two guys that had developed this uh, analysis system and uh, sat with them and said, look, I'd like this for referees. And they go, we're not interested. This is for football teams. And I managed to persuade them by saying, look, I'm, I'm prepared to come and give you an insight into refereeing in order for you to provide the product. And by the way, we will pay the same price that, that football clubs are paying to have the system. And so, um, you know, the more managers you can communicate with, the greater amount of experience you get. I mean, look, let me give an example. I can remember uh, David Moyes when he was at Everton being very unhappy about uh, Fellaini uh, getting yellow cards almost every game. And when you actually looked, in 10 games, he'd had 10 yellow cards. And so I've, I've agreed that I'll go and meet uh, David Moyes at Everton. And, um, but I've got to do my own work. So I get these 10 yellow cards put onto a, a, uh, my laptop and I start looking at them. And I've, I've gone, whoops, that's definitely not a yellow card. Uh, that that's a foul. And I think there were two out of the 10 that were nailed on not yellow cards. So uh, I, I joined him and, and his uh, manager, Anfalani, with an with a interpreter. And out of that conversation, there was a great understanding why the, the, the player was getting a yellow card. And, and putting it uh, quickly... You had Fellani very close to his opponent. His opponent was skillful. Fellani was acting as a defender. And, and what was happening was, by the speed of the forward, he's gone past Fellani, he's spun him. And as a result, Fellani's then either tripping him or pulling him back because he's missed the, he's missed the speed of the challenge. When you saw that, then that allowed David Moyes to, I'm sure, make an adjustment to Fulani. And, and we both had a greater understanding. I had a greater understanding of the complications and complexity <laughs> of, of football to some degree. But, yeah, I, I, I think that's part and parcel. So at the end of the cup final, you know, uh, the, the Keith Birkinshaw's a Barnsley lad, if you like, uh, and he came up and thanked me. So, but you're only as good as your next game. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can't. Well, be well, the funny thing is that that game. One one of the reasons why that game sticks in my mind was because we were on. I was on a family holiday. I mean, at the time, I was only what was it, eleven, something like eleven, twelve at the time. And we were on a family holiday, and we was actually in uh, Clacton, uh, at Butlins. And in exactly. those days, a bit like the old Heidi High, they used to have two rooms. They'd have one room which you could go and watch BBC, and one yeah. room you could go and watch ITV. And they used to have these <laughs> two rooms opposite each other. And I, and I remember going in there in this smoke-filled room because everybody was smoking and the rest of yeah. it. And I sort of sneaked in at the back, you know, watched the first half on the one, one room in the BBC and went the second half and watched it in ITV in the, other, in the other room. So it always sort of sticks in my mind and seeing that seeing that goal, um, you know, from R Ricky Villa at the end was just was yeah. an incredible goal. Yeah. Even as an Arsenal fan, you have to put your hands up and say, what a fantastic, yeah. Uh, yeah. What a fantastic goal. But... This is the end of the part one of our My Life in Football with, with, with Keith. We'll be back next week when I'm so much looking forward to the rest of Keith's story um, with part two of My Life in Football with the one and only Mr. Keith Hackett.